What you doing? Hey, just finishing this claim to get Dave back on the road. Nice. I wonder what Dave's doing. Thing. We've got you covered. Hey, is the power off on this? I don't know. Just take it off. Safety violation. Unsafe work conditions. In the construction trades unions, safety is our highest priority, and we train you to recognize and speak out on unsafe working conditions so that everyone arrives and goes home safely. Learn about careers in construction at georgiaconstructioncareers.com. Good afternoon and welcome to the 343rd episode of the Alpha Insurance Georgia Prep Sports Drive for the GHSA State Title. Today we're going to be joined by Thomas Smith. He is the head coach at Wheeler County. He's making a return there. He was there for three seasons, went to Dodge County for one, and now he's back. So we'll see how the last several seasons played out and what was behind his decision to, to come back. And when he was there in 2020, 2022, before Dodge County, he actually uh, had Wheeler County ranked for the first time in 25 years. And they had a good season last year too, so I feel like they're gonna hit the ground running. Uh, I've got some other new coaching hires with a breakdown of their resume that we haven't talked about yet. I'm gonna hit some baseball news and then um, we'll get into the interview with Coach Smith at 12:20. Uh, but first, I gotta say I'm a little heartbroken today because I just found out Graham has never seen the movie Tommy Boy. So I'm gonna call him out right now. He's got to see it as soon as possible. All right. So let's start though with this interesting article because I've said Georgia in terms of coaching for high school, it really is the number one go-to destination for high school coaches for a variety of reasons. And we've seen with these coaching changes, a lot of coaches that win state titles um, end up, well, some that don't win state titles, but they want to come to Georgia. And there's actually an article that says, why are so many Florida high school football coaches leaving for jobs in Georgia? And the reason this article was written that we'll get into was the Twitter account for the coaches. So this is their version of the GACA. They actually put this tweet out um, about half a month ago. It says, for the coaches, if you want to coach in Georgia, I would reach out to Coach Roland. He's the one that just moved to Camden County as he builds his staff. It's to your benefit to get to know Coach Lamb, uh, former Calhoun coach, uh, the entire Lamb family, they're at um, Mercer. They've started another college program uh, at the D2 level in Georgia. He says, believe me, young coaches, I would cross the line sooner than later um, toward retirement matter. So this is a Florida Coaching Association encouraging Florida coaches to come to Georgia. That's how real this is. So let's look at the different variables uh, just so you don't have to take uh, my word for it. All right, so it's not just one thing, it's everything. During the month of February and into March, six Florida high school head football coaches left behind winning programs for the opportunity to coach elsewhere. Eric Lodge left Seminole for a school in South Carolina and the other five are heading to schools in Georgia. That's Travis Rowland, he's leaving mainland for Camden County, replacing uh, Jeff Heron. Uh, Aaron Shepard left Ocoee High School for McEachern. And then Dustin Adkins left Hawthorne for Ola. Now I'll get into his resume in a sec. And man, Dustin Adkins, if you look at this guy, he looks like a bigger Travis Kelsey with a bigger beard and he's completely sleeved up. So he's one of the most intimidating coaches I've seen. That is uh, Dustin Adkins taking over the Ola program. Uh, that was in that region last year with Warner Robins, Jones County, um, and made a historic season. They're replacing Coach Kazi, who came to Ola after winning state titles 
in Alabama, and he was one of the three from the Birmingham area that came over, and that included um, former Hoover head coach uh, Josh Niblett, and then also, who else was, oh yeah, Jason Curvin, former uh, Hoover coordinator, who went to Alpharetta, and then Coach Kazi came over. So now Dustin Atkins is coming and taking over that OLA program from Florida. And then Robert Paxia, uh, he left uh, Flagler, who's also at uh, Lake Gibson. And he went to Winderboro. Jay Walls left Navari for Bainbridge. Why are they leaving? Well, in Roland's case, he walked away from a state championship winning team to take over at Camden County and said the perception for the outside looking in is about the money. The salary is obviously important, but it's just one of the many parts that make up the differences, Roland said. People think it's all about the money, and yes, that is important, but there's a lot more. It's not just one thing, it's everything. Now, obviously, Camden County, that's a school very close to Florida, so it is a different state, but it's not the, the biggest move in terms of distance. Here are some of the top reasons high school football coaches uh, leave Florida to take jobs in Georgia. Uh, overall resources. So we heard it directly from uh, Mike Nash, Dunwoody's football coach and lacrosse coach, talking about how when they played their out-of-state games in Florida, very few teams have turf fields down in Florida. So I think it's safe to say the facilities are better, and it's not necessarily a grass versus turf argument. It's practice fields. When you have a turf field, uh, that makes it easier for all the sports to share that field and have that practice field that you don't have to worry about upkeep uh, throughout the seasons. Uh, every coach that I spoke to said the same thing when asked about the biggest difference between Florida versus Georgia, and that was resources. Now that can mean a variety of different things, but Coach Rowland said that he needs all available resources at his disposal as he and his Camden County staff prepare to play in Region 1 at 6A, formerly 7A, which had long been considered one of the toughest regions in Georgia high school football. And it really is. You look at this year's state championship, Milton versus Walton. It was the first time since, I think, 1999 that there wasn't a Gwinnett or South Georgia school in the state championship. South Georgia only in the highest classification. So it only has one region, and yet it's been able to produce a state finalist all those different years now that can mean a variety of different things we talked about that so this is more from coach Rowland. he says i told the search committee here at uh, camden that me and my staff want to see how we can do if we have the best resources available to us a phenomenal weight room a certified strength and weight coach a phenomenal booster club we want to see how well we can do with those and other resources available to us after all, Roland and his assistants did it with back-to-back -back state championship game appearances at Mainland, but it was tough. It was back-breaking work in Florida, Roland said. We were the strength and conditioning coach, and we were the booster club, and we mowed the grass if it needed to get done. Somebody jumped in and got it done, but that's not ideal or efficient. Training facilities. So Georgia, some of these big-time programs, they've got indoor facilities, uh, Carrollton, Colquitt, uh, Gainesville. So I don't know how many Florida schools have indoors. Obviously, not all Georgia ones do, but when you take a big-time job uh, like some of these, the facilities are really uh, a huge difference. So top-of-the-line training facilities for the athletes, including indoors, spacious weight rooms, and outdoor turf practice fields. One of those schools is Coffee High School in Douglas, uh, yeah, Douglas, Georgia, which is where former and longtime Florida high school coach uh, Mike Coe landed two seasons ago. And he was another coach that came from Florida and went to Georgia. And he actually said it um, after they won the state title this year. But we had him on the show. He said it wasn't, maybe we're taking the quote too seriously, but he said, People, after he won state titles in Florida, said, well, it's one thing to win in Florida. It's going to be tough to get it done in Georgia, especially coffee, a program that had never won a state title before. Uh, but he came in and led them to the championship this year and a perfect season. 
Coe spent 28 years coaching in Florida, including a 19-year stint at Madison County. He won five state titles with the Cowboys, serving as offensive coordinator for the 2007 championship and then head coach for the next four. He was 136 and 27 overall. He talked about the training facilities at Coffee as one of the several reasons why he decided to come coach in Georgia. Our weight room here at Coffee is unreal, and we can get so much done in there and get a bunch of kids working at the same time. Uh, then later this month, our indoor facility will be ready to roll. So no more missed time because of that wet bulb or light or lightning. That is a huge deal. All right, the field houses. So no, another uh, key aspect uh, it gives the coaches an area uh, where they can really uh, break down film. Um, obviously, they're co uh, teaching in the school as well, but just to have a separate field house, that's another um, big advantage. You can use it for so many different uh, purposes as well including the locker room. Uh, otherwise, schools that don't have the field house, they're sharing um, usually the basketball gym for home and visitors for uh, football games. Uh, the top of the line athletic training facilities at McEachern played a part in attracting longtime Florida coach Aaron Shepard to the Peach State. He spent the last six years at Ocoee in the Orlando area. Uh, so he talks about the facilities as well. So the next reason, financial resources. Greater financial support for high school football programs in Georgia is another reason Shepard made the move. I had always wanted to coach in Georgia because I knew the financial resources were so much better than what we had in Florida. And despite leading the Knights to the first ever final, report, sorry, final four appearance in the Florida High School Football State Playoffs in 2022, the travel accommodations that were required to shuffle the team to their playoff games each week completely wiped out their budget. It says we spent our entire budget making sure we got the team to the playoff games, which was renting the buses, feeding the players. Uh, Shepard said we had to travel for every playoff game. Instead of celebrating a milestone achievement for the school and the football team making it to the semis for the first time, Shepard was staring at a zero budget. So another reason they talk about the workload, uh, and that was something Coach Roland pointed out, uh, having a bigger staff and just a more efficient way to handle things like mowing the field and getting everything um, running on time. Because here at McEachern, I just get to uh, coach football. Coaching football was just one of the many things I had to do at Ocoee. Uh, I was front and center with the fundraising, whether it was standing on the sidewalk at public selling value cards, cookie dough, or whatever it took. All right, so another reason. And this is becoming, I'd say, a newer phenomenon, and one of the leading schools in this department is Gainesville. They feed their players three hot meals a day throughout the entire year. Uh, nutrition's big at North Oconee also, they have one of the best weight programs in the state. And we see it paying off in every sport. Uh, so that is another reason. Many Georgia high school football programs offer a wide range of nutrition programs and services for the players, like the full service kitchen at Coffee uh, that Mike Co mentioned earlier. Uh, Coffee also went to Bucky's uh, after the state title. And the nutrition available to the kids is just great here at Coffee High School, he said. Uh, Aaron Shepard also praised McEachern's nutrition program, calling it second to none. Uh, Michael Martin, the director of football operations at McEachern, said the importance of the nutrition program is paramount to the football team. Dustin Atkins, Ola's new coach, said he's rolling out a nutrition program at Ola this year. We're on a mass gainer in protein powder uh, that we have all the kids on. We just started that when I got here to Ola. Atkins said it is an improvement over what he was able to offer at Florida. All right, another reason, and keep in mind, this is coming from Florida's coaching um, association. They're actually encouraging their coaches to go to Georgia. Uh, all coaches expect support from their school boards and administration, but not all coaches receive it. That's one of the huge differences between coaching in Georgia and Florida. And Mike Coe has noticed that since arriving at Coffee. All right, the professional professionalism and teamwork has also been refreshing. James Thompson also saw the lack of support 
for Florida high school coaches and at one point tried to do something about it. Um, in 2021, Thompson uh, co-founded the Florida Coaches uh, Coalition. Thomas said he wanted to put together an organization that could serve as an advocate for high school football coaches in the state of Florida. Uh, financial comp compensation, yes, for the majority of coaching positions, Georgia high school coaches make more in base salary, bonuses, and other financial incentives. Uh, James Thompson recalled an experience he had as a high school football coach in Florida trying to make ends meet that many other Florida high school coaches can probably relate to. I was a head coach at Gainesville High School in Florida in 2012. That's funny, I think that's the same year uh, Gainesville won the state title with Deshaun Watson. So we were 14-0 and and ranked number six in the nation and playing for a state championship that year. We lost to Miami Central 37-14. to Instead of being able to look at game film or just relax at home the day after, Thompson had more work to do but not as a football coach. I had to wake up the next day and go to work at the Luau at SeaWorld. Think about how that played out. Not so well. Travis Rowland was announced a new head coach for Camden. A tweet posted to X, this is the one I have been talking about, formerly known, or whatever. Uh, Florida Coaches is the account. Encourage coaches in Florida to make the move to Georgia. And this is a tweet responding to it from Coach Co. Uh, Coffee's coach. He says, the best decision I've made in a long time and it's tough because he obviously won five state titles in Madison County. He's not trying to disrespect the program, but he's trying to raise awareness for the opportunities. And this is only going to continue to elevate Georgia above other states. Florida has doubled the population of Georgia, so there's more high schools, but the opportunities are better. And per capita, Georgia's producing more uh, NFL prospects. D1 and college signees than any other state. Texas has a big population too. And if you look at some of their bigger high schools like Allen High School, uh, that is an enrollment of almost 7,000 students in their school. Uh, the biggest school in Georgia is Mill Creek. That's about 3,500. So Texas has some schools that in terms of enrollment are way bigger. Florida, it's more of just more high schools, more divisions because it's a bigger state, but Georgia is offering the best overall uh, situation for these coaches. So he says, I loved my time at Madison County and especially those kids in the community, but the struggle to pay the bills, be told good job or thank you and appreciated by those in charge. No, it's night and day. So that is, and it goes on. I mean, there's more reasons, but this is the first time I've ever seen someone like actually get quotes from the coaches that had made that move and then um, put it into a great comparison. That was written by Phil Jones on March 13th, titled, Why Are So Many Florida High School Football Coaches Leaving for Jobs in Georgia? Uh, so you guys can check that out if you're interested. But let's go ahead. We'll take a break. We'll get into our guests on the other side, and then we'll pick up on some other coaches after the interview. Hey, does it matter if this leaks? It don't matter to me. Can't see it from my house. Illegal use of hands and proper training. GeorgiaConstructionCareers.com has 14 different highly skilled trades with tuition free training in our certified apprenticeship programs to train you the right way. Find your career at GeorgiaConstructionCareers.com. All right, welcome back. So now that we've talked about some of the coaching movements, let's talk to our next guest, Thomas Smith. He is returning to Wheeler County. Hey, how are you? Hey, I can't hear you. All right, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Awesome. 
All right. So I was mentioning that you were at Wheeler County, went to Dodge for one year, and now you're back. So walk us through how uh, just that happened over these last few years. Yeah, I was at Wheeler the last three years, and uh, we the last year I was here, we went to the playoffs, and uh, we were getting things headed in the right direction, and the opportunity to, came, to go to Dodge uh, came up. So we, we went to Dodge for last season, but um, just – Really wanted to get back to Wheeler. Uh, maybe missed kids administration here. Uh, the coach Engel had, had called me and told me he was going to uh, retire. Uh, so the opportunity to come back to Wheeler was there. Uh, just excited to get back to work with the kids. We got back in January uh, and started hitting it hard in the weight room and getting ready for spring ball. And then um, the first time you went to Wheeler County and took over, um, were, were you previously on the staff, or how did you get that initial head coaching job? Uh, well, I was at uh, a private school, and I'd hired uh, Coach Randy Collins, who had been the head coach at Wheeler as my defensive coordinator. Um, and he, he was with me at the private school for about three years, and then a um, uh, Wheeler County job came open. Uh, and he told me he thought it could be a, a, a good place. And so we, uh, we came to Wheeler, and – the first year was able to go five and five and then uh, just slowly progressed until our last year going to the playoffs here. Yep. And so that was uh, Robert Toombs Academy. Um, so you were there, I believe, a decade. You guys did win a state title. So what was that like just being there for a pretty significant amount of time and then going to Wheeler County? And what did you notice about that program when you first got there? Uh, well, I'd been at Robert Toombs for nine years. Uh, we were able to win one state championship and played for three others. Um, and then from Toombs County originally, I uh, uh, played at Toombs and was an assistant coach at Toombs County. Uh, and then it, you, you know you want to get back to the public school system, but each year you've got some new set of kids and you don't want to leave the kids, but then uh, the opportunity to go to Wheeler came up and the first thing I noticed was just uh, you got some really hard working young men that want to be pushed um, and that that was the biggest thing about Wheeler was just the way the kids worked and, and wanted to get better yep and I couldn't help but notice that first year at Wheeler County was in 2020 we all know how insane that season was so uh, do you feel like the program? you're pretty familiar with it and after going through that COVID year um, what did that teach you guys? Um, the gear just made you be very uh, resourceful I guess is the word. We were doing Zoom meetings with the kids and then when they opened it back up where you could get small groups in we'd bring them in by position groups to lift and I actually think that helped us just because we uh, even though you're spending way more time because you're having to bring them in in groups of 10, uh, it lets you give a lot more individual attention to each kid. Uh, and I, I think that really helped us as far as uh, coming in that, that first year, getting to know the kids and the kids getting to know us and what was expected and that kind of thing. But it, it really allowed you to spend more one-on-one -on -one time with the kids. And then that 2022 season at Wheeler County, you guys, you mentioned you made the playoffs. You came out, started the season, a big win over uh, GMC. So what was it about the off-season program that allowed you guys to really come out hot that season and really set the tone from the get-go? Um, it, it was a, a weird story. We, we got a brand-new school built. Um, so while they were building it that summer, for all our summer workouts, we didn't have power. Um, so we had generators in here with light constructions and some fans, but it, it was really hot all summer in the weight room. Uh, the kids just came to work, but I think it gave us an edge early in that season just because our guys were used to the heat. Uh, we're used to the temperature. It was hotter in the weight room than it was outside. But uh, we had some really good senior leadership that year. Um, and the good part about a lot of those guys from that year uh, that were – sophomores and contributors for us now is their their senior year so they uh, a lot of guys know what to expect and what, what we're trying to do program wise yep and then i noticed um 
you, well, you said you went to Tombs County High School. You guys have played them in recent seasons. So are they on the schedule again this year? No, year we, we the way we had it set up, um, we were able to get it one more region team moved into our region. McGunning came back to the region. Um, so we were able to get four non-region games um, with, with schools pretty close to our size. Uh, but our our last year before we went to Dodge, uh, we had a, a competitive game with Tombs. It was 7 nothing at halftime, and they were able to pull away a little bit late. But that gave our guys some confidence for being able to play with a, a larger school. And, um, but Tombs, those guys do a great job. Uh, excited to see their program continuing to build. Yep, and then – so you said you're familiar with some of that um, 2024 class that got to contribute uh, as sophomores. So what have you seen from those guys just now that they're seniors? Um, is it evident that they've been putting in the work and uh, how hungry are they for their senior seasons? Yeah, um, they're, they're excited. I was, was glad to get back with them. Um, Last year, um, they had some, some key injuries. Um, they were lost some really close one-score ball games, but had, had a lot of injuries. So it, it just gave them that, that extra push for this year to go to go make it something special for them this senior year. Yep, and I bet if we looked at it on teams that uh, were in the most one-score games, I mean, that was pretty much their entire region schedule. So. What does it take to be able to to win those tight ones? What are you guys going to work on this off season to be able to handle the fourth quarter and build build up that confidence? Uh, the biggest thing is just getting getting enough depth uh, in single A. Uh, I mean, your main guys are, are playing both sides of the ball for you, so being able to get get some young guys that can go in and and steal a series for you. So you can rest them, you guys. So in the fourth quarter, you're, you're fresh enough to, to go win the ball game. But I, I think it's key is just getting some some role players, uh, some young guys that can go in and, and play the series for you without getting you getting you behind, and and that way you can have your guys fresh in the fourth quarter. But the, the whole key is building that depth, uh, getting young guys where they can go in and, and play a little bit for you. For sure. And, yeah, lots of guys are playing both ways. But who are some of the big-time playmakers that are going to be those guys that just don't come off the field this season, contribute on both sides of the ball, and um, really being the, the leaders and the impact players for you guys? Uh, we've got a really strong uh, senior and junior class. Uh, Junior-wise, you've got Alvin Ricks. Um, who, who rushed for over a thousand yards last year? He started for us as a freshman. Uh, he'll be a junior this year, and we're we're excited. Uh, big things for him. Uh, Justin Culver, Sincere Marks, uh, Rico Wooten, all of those guys are juniors uh, that we'll we'll count on heavily. Uh, and then senior wise, uh, most of our skill guys are juniors, but most of our offensive linemen. Uh, that we're counting on this year are going to be some senior guys. Uh, we got KJ Williams that's coming back. Uh, he's going to play guard for us on offense and defensive end. Um, and then you got JT Gillis, uh, who's probably will be one of our, our bigger recruits as a as a senior. He's six three, two fifty. Uh, he'll play tight end and uh, defensive end for us. Um, he, uh, Jordan Bridges, Aiden Ackley. Um, we have a group of seniors uh, up front that'll that'll help set that physical tone that we're wanting to set. And then offensively, are you guys pretty set on who you're going to be tabbing for the quarterback, or is there going to be a competition at that position this offseason? season? Um, we're we're pretty set. Um, we we graduated a senior last year that had been a, a two year starter for us at quarterback. Uh, Rhett Rogers, but Rico Wooten has been a starter for us at free safety, uh, and he played uh, receiver for us last for him last year. And we're gonna we've already started working with him when we got here in January at quarterback. Uh, he's done a really good job, very smart kid, um, and just I think from him playing free safety, it's helped him see the field really well. Uh, and he's done a good job being a leader for us so far this offseason. And he'll, he'll be the guy that's running quarterback for us. 
you know, this kid says he's got experience at safety. I think he's also a point guard for you guys in basketball. So what's the uh, rest of the offseason schedule looking like for you guys? Um, when's the team going to be hitting the field for spring? And then what are some of the things you guys have planned for uh, those summer months? Um, spring wise, we're going to, we, we weren't going to do spring. Our baseball team's doing really good right now. So we, we're expecting not to have a lot of the baseball guys at spring ball. But we're bringing in, um, my defensive coordinator from Dodge, uh, Wesley Lowry and my defensive line coach at Dodge is going to be coming. Um, so this will be their first time seeing the guys. Um, so we're going to, we're going to do it. Our spring is going to be more geared towards drill work and letting, letting the defensive staff, uh, sort of figure where they're wanting to put the guys at and that kind of stuff. But we'll do spring uh, the the middle two weeks in May um, and just do a little with uh, a lot more drills and then we'll be teamwork. Uh, and then we'll get to June, uh, setting the ground running. Uh, we'll be going uh, from 8 to 1130 uh, in the mornings. And then we've got the, the two OTAs. you got one in June and one in July. Um, and so we're, we're excited to get get the whole product, the whole team on the field, be able to see them all together. Because right now we're doing a lot of four-on-ones and that kind of thing. That's right. And then let's go back to the offense real quick. You're talking about uh, Alvin uh, Ricks last year, over 1,000 yards. Looks like he's a pretty physical guy. Um, what Was he there uh, last time you were at Wheeler County, or is he kind of a new piece that you get to work with? No, he, he started for us as a freshman uh, our last year. Actually, the first time he touched a football against GMC, uh, he returned the kick uh, 98 yards for a touchdown. So we, we've we been uh, familiar with Alvin. Uh, saw him coming up through the middle school and then able to have him as a freshman. And then uh, now he's, he's probably put on about 15 pounds of muscle, so he's weighing in at about 200 pounds, um, expecting him to have a really big year this year. Absolutely, and then uh, obviously, I mean, he's proven uh, his first two years that he can uh, be the bell cow. But what about some other guys um, that are going to be able to contribute in the run game that you think have an opportunity to, to step up and earn themselves a ball? Um, sincere Marks is a guy that played for us a lot as a freshman um, last year. Uh, I mean, not right his freshman year at State. I think he got third in the hundred um so he's a speed guy for us it's a nice change of pace from alvin um and then justin culver with us this year he uh started for us linebacker as a freshman um he'll be back and we're counting on him to be a physical runner and he's got really good um and then out, out wide a receiver we've got to find some guys to, to replace uh, jeremiah kensey um, but Nathan Wright has done a really good job uh, as a basketball player that's going to come out and play football this year. We think he's going to be able to help us a lot at receiver. Okay, and then defensively, um, I think you mentioned some of the guys in your defensive line, but uh, who's a guy out there that understands the role, can communicate well, and is going to be a, a big-time leader for you guys? Uh, defensively, Lane Connell uh, was the middle linebacker for him last year. Uh, he, he got a lot of playing time for us as a freshman. Started a couple of games for us at tight end and DN. Uh, but now he's grown into sort of an outside linebacker type. Uh, I think he's going to be a, a good good one. He'll help call some stuff on defense. Uh, and we return most of the defensive line uh, that's, that's played in the system before so they, they understand what we're doing. Um, the big spots is going to be at corner, being able to uh, uh, replace some guys in the secondary. We do, like we said, we return Rico at free safety, but having to find some guys to play at corner. Yep. You had mentioned, I think, a receiver that might be coming out and playing football for the first time. So it's not necessarily unheard of, uh, especially at these Class A, Division One and Two schools, but – in total, do you guys have several guys that will be suiting up for the first time this year? Um, no, that we, we we hit the halls when we got back in January, and we probably got 
uh, three or four guys that will be coming out for the first time. But we have a, a really big rise in eighth grade class. I think we've got 18 signed up so far that will be freshmen next year. Um, and those guys are, are going to be key for us because, like we talked about, getting them, those guys the way, if they're not necessarily ready to be a starter, but get them where they can come in and play a couple of series for you so that you can rest some of your older guys. And then who do you guys open up uh, the season with? You mentioned you got six region games. They added Montgomery County first, but four non-region. So who's going to be the opener? Uh, Wilkinson County uh, was a playoff team from last year. I think they were the two seed in that region. Uh, we open up with them. We, we always try to get our, our opening game to be a, a, a playoff level team just so it gives your guys something to push push through or push forward during the summer when it's hot and it gets monotonous. So you can sort of say, hey, we got to get ready for a really good team coming up. Uh, so Wilkinson County will be, be our opening game. Awesome. And then what are your overall expectations for the region? Um, is it pretty much the same as the last time you were there? Yeah. Uh, it's, our region has changed some up and down as far as when they went to uh, the lower A, uh, so that changed a little bit, but the, the core is, is still there. I mean, you've got Wilcox County, Dooley County, Telfair, Hallsville, Truland, Montgomery. Um, is, so you've got a lot of schools that are proximity um, that helps produce natural rivalries, but it's been a very competitive region. I think they've had uh, three different teams have won the region that last four years so it's a it's a very balanced region but very competitive every friday night yep and then last point i mean is there anything in the month of june that you guys try to do um differently i know some people do these paddy camps others focus on seven on seven but anything this off season those summer months that you guys will be able to do yeah june uh like we talked about we've got some trying to break in some new corners uh, so we'll do uh, probably have one seven on seven a week with another team, and then the last week of June, we before the dead week, we'll go to a padded camp uh, for two days, and that that just helps you see your guys in pads from spring ball to the end, and then you've got one more in July, so you're trying to just gauge their improvement uh, from from week to week with. Awesome. Well, Coach Smith, I really appreciate you coming on. I know you got a lot of your guys playing baseball right now, playing a lot of other sports, but the uh, season's going to be here uh, before we know it, and we wish you guys the best of luck. Yes, sir. Thank you all for the You bet. All right. So there goes Wheeler County and Coach Smith. I think it's going to be just great to see what they're able to do this season. He's coming back. He's familiar with them. He talked about um, the backfield some of the guys that he got to know when they were sophomores and freshmen now stepping into their upperclassmen season so i think it's going to be uh, very exciting and they got a big opener against wilkinson county we saw what they did last time he was head coach they won their opener against uh, georgia military college that was a big result they won that one 42 to 14 um, Georgia military was ranked number nine at the time and that big victory um, put Wheeler County at number eight it was the first time they were ranked in 25 years uh, they ended up falling to Toombs County coach Smith's alma mater says he said it was a seven nothing game at the half they ended up falling 21 nothing um, but then they rebounded had some big wins over Montgomery County who is now going to be in the region and so a lot of familiar uh, foes. They aren't gonna have to have to travel too much for their region games or non-region. And I think they're gonna be uh, very excited about this year. So there you have it with Wheeler County. Let's go ahead and take a break. Thank our sponsors and we'll be back on the other side with more news. Dang, where you get this car? You need to join the union. The union? Absolutely, yes, you can get 10 of these. Union construction workers earn the highest wages with the best benefits and the most protection in the construction industry. Find your career in construction. Go to georgiaconstructioncareers.com and start your future today.
All right, welcome back. So let's look at some of these new coaching hires. Hopefully, we'll have some of them um, on this um, on the show in the next couple of weeks. But let's look at Bainbridge and their new head coach, Jay Walls. So he is replacing Jeff Littleton. Jeff Littleton left Bainbridge um, for the Tiff County job. Tiff County, historic program, but man, they've been struggling these last few seasons. They've obviously uh, had to go up against just a gauntlet of teams every year. They previously were in the same region as Camden, Colquitt, Valdosta, and Lowndes last year. They were in 6A, and it's hard to say that it got any easier for them. It was Lee County, Houston County, Northside Warner Robins, and that region. So Bainbridge, um, they're going to be led by Jay Walls, and then Jeff Littleton, as we mentioned, is going to Tiff County. But Coach Walls comes in, and if you remember Bainbridge last year, they fell to Perry 7-3 to in the quarterfinals. That's how close they were. Perry obviously won the state title, but man, if they had one touchdown in that game, uh, they would have won and had a chance to win another uh, state title. Bainbridge is obviously a historic program and Kirby Smart's alma mater. All right, so Coach Walls is the new head football coach for the Bearcats. Uh, he was approved. Uh, this is last month. Uh, he has an impressive coaching career spanning 27 seasons. He's bringing a wealth of experience. All right, so his quote, he goes, first, I'd like to thank Boyd English, that's the superintendent, uh, the principal, Chris Merritt, uh, for this opportunity. Coach Wall's accomplishments speak volumes about his uh, success throughout his career. He has an overall record of 205 and 104 at schools, including Suwannee High School, Tift County, and then most recently, Navarre in Florida. Uh, he has led teams to 21 playoff appearances out of 27 years. His notable achievements include multiple district and regional championships, and he was recognized uh, Coach of the Year multiple times. He has had 27 players sign at Division I football scholarships as head coach. Uh, coach Walls and his wife Amy, they're both natives of Tallahassee. She's a proud graduate of Florida State. And they have three daughters. Let's see. Uh, so, yeah, a veteran coach, 27 years of experience. He's been in Georgia before at Tip County, but now he's taking over Bainbridge. I think they're going to be just fine. And you look at Bainbridge last year, they were one of the only teams in 4A that were able to beat Ware County. Uh, Benedictine also beat them. Um, but they always challenge themselves um, with that early schedule playing all the South Georgia powerhouses and so they're going to have an exciting season but they got a coach that is going to be able to handle uh, the, the spotlight. Alright so another coach I want to highlight this is Pat Collins he is going to Tattnall County and I was very close to getting him on the show but he w had a conflict let's look at them real quick all right, so Pat Collins, he is another guy that uh, has a lot of experience, I believe, at the private school level. Um, but he was most recently at South Effingham. And this is the type of offense he's going to bring uh, to Tattnall County. So it says, South Effingham wants to be deceptive on offense, maybe to the point of not even having a name for its new base formation. Um, but a new addition to the Mustang staff, Pat Collins, the new head coach at uh, Tattnall County. He will work specifically with the running backs and bring new ideas to how they're able to move the football. He is an expert in the wing tee offense, implementing some of its concepts while recently turning around football programs at Southeast Bullock and Bullock Academy. People say you're wing tee and they have an idea of what it is, but we're very diverse in what we're going to do. We'll feature a lot of formations. We'll figure out what our kids can do to be the most successful and then do those things. It's a process. Right now, we're in the infancy. Ultimately, head coach Nathan Clark and offensive coordinator Alan Sperling make the Southeast strategic calls before becoming head coach. Clark was a successful offensive coordinator running a spread attack at 
Lee County when the Trojans won the Class 6A state championship in 2018. So that's what I wanted to bring up. Uh, coach Collins, now the head coach at uh, Tattnall County, so I think a Class A Division One school, he was the offensive coordinator when Lee County won the state title in 2018. Um, so that is his resume right there. Let's move on to another guy, uh, East Forsyth High School. And they are pretty brand new. Um, this is only going to be their third season coming up. They made noise their first season. They actually had a big win over Forsyth Central. So this is a brand new Forsyth High School, uh, earning their first ever win a couple, let me just pull it up. That was in 2022. And then last year, they were in Region 8 in Class 4A. That was the biggest uh, region in terms of total teams in Class 4A and one of the biggest in the entire state. Uh, with the expansion of seven classes and the split Class A, typically you only have like six teams in a region. Um, they had nine teams, so they only had two non-region games. And so last year, they were led by Brian Allison, and he's retiring, or he did retire. I think he had about 37 years of coaching experience. Uh, so he was the first head coach uh, at East Forsyth, led them to the playoffs last season. They fell to Luella 26-21, to uh, but they had a great season. They started 5-0. and uh, They beat uh, East Hall 42-0, Walnut Grove 21 nothing to improve to 2 and 0 in the region. And so they were up there in the standings with the powerhouses North Oconee, Madison County. But then they fell to Cherokee Bluff uh, 10 to 3. Uh, then they had to play North Oconee, who was the region champion and one of the best teams in Class 4A. They lost that one, then they lost to Madison County. So they fell to 2 and 3 and they had two must-win games to make the playoffs. They were able to do it. Chesity 51-20, North Hall 42-39. East Forsyth is ranked across the board. They've actually been in the top 10 in basketball this season. They're currently in the top 10 in baseball. They made the playoffs in football. And keep in mind, it's only year three for them. But now they have a new head coach, and that is Dustin Cannon. He was promoted from defensive coordinator to take over. Um, this is what they had to say, and I know the Broncos are very excited with what they've already been able to get done. It is rare that you can hire someone with the experience of coordinating all three phases of football and understands the community where we were at at East, Hollis said. That is the athletic director. Coach Cannon has the unique perspective of watching the East Forsyth community grow and change since playing youth football in Forsyth County. He truly believes that the potential for East Forsyth has just begun to show through and that we can be something special. I'm excited to see our program continue in a successful direction under Coach Cannon's direction. And honestly, Forsyth County has a lot of pretty new schools, um, even schools like West Forsyth. Um, these haven't been around for even like 30 years. So Forsyth is the fastest growing county. Um, East Forsyth is just the latest new school. Denmark popped up about six years ago, had instant success. Now they're in 7A. And so East Forsyth is hitting the ground running. He is a Georgia Southern uh, graduate. He's a Forsyth County native. He's coached in Forsyth County for most of his careers. He's been at Forsyth Central in East Forsyth. He began his career at Effingham County. Uh, he has been integral in establishing the football program and building the program into a playoff team, Hollis said. He's in, been involved in all aspects of starting the football program in the East and is ready to take the lead as head coach. We are fortunate to have him here and be able to hand the reins of leadership to him. So he's still a pretty young coach, replacing a veteran that launched the program um, but this is a big opportunity for him because this is a playoff program, brand new facilities, and there is a lot of excitement around them um, from the start. I mean, East Forsyth 
they had packed stands year one. Uh, last year, they truly produced a, a hostile environment uh, for for um, visiting teams. And there's something about being a new program, kind of the new kids on the block. You really sense that they're out there trying to prove something. Uh, when they would win those region games, I mean, those students, not just the players, but the entire fans, I mean, they really had a reason to celebrate uh, just to see – uh, the the program um, start to make a name for itself. Uh, they finished last year seven and four and made the playoffs for the first time. All right, so sticking in Class 4A and Region 8, it's the best region in terms of top 10 teams in baseball. And North Hall is one of those reasons why they are up there with North Oconee and obviously East Forsyth. North Hall is ranked as high as number 27 in the state, regardless of classification. Uh, but they actually just had to forfeit uh, seven of their wins. They self-reported um, an ineligible player. And we'll talk about what this is going to mean for them. North Hall's baseball team has self-reported the use of an academically ineligible player and forfeited its first seven games, all of which they won. Uh, the GHSA confirmed on Thursday, right after my rankings came out. Uh, wins over Newton, Dawson County, Habersham Central, Chapel Hill, Jackson County, Tucker, and Mountain View were reversed. Now North Hall's record is 7-9 and nine instead of 14-2. and two. Uh, So they had to add seven wins, sorry, seven losses, going from 14-2 to two to now 7-9. North Hall is 6-2 and two in region play in Region 8-4A and is number 5 in the rankings. North Hall won state titles in 2017 and 2021. So it changes their record, but it does not impact the region standings at all. Each one of those seven games they forfeited were non-region games, so it will blemish their overall record. But I still think um, being – four and two in that region and winning all those, I think you still have to put them uh, high in the pole. So let's just look at uh, their next big matchups. All right, so they have beaten North Oconee three to two in their first matchup. They also beat um, East Forsyth in two out of three games, but they are currently uh, because of those two losses, I think in a tie for third um, in that region. You have Cherokee Bluff at 6-1, and one, Seconder 8-2, North Hall 6-2, and two, North Oconee 6-2, and two, and then East Forsyth 7-3. Uh, Walnut Grove, who is currently number six in that region, actually beat Cherokee Bluff, the number one team. So it is, once again, a complete log jam. Um, Eight teams have winning records overall, and it's going to be a fight to the finish. But currently, you still have three teams in that top ten uh, with Seconder, um, a team that could crack the rankings next week. And let me just go ahead and pull those up real quick. So here are the week six baseball rankings and how it shifted. So in class 7A, Brookwood moved up to number five after picking up its ninth strength win um, and improving to 14 and three. The Broncos defeated Grayson uh, on Wednesday to improve to five and0 in the region. Grayson, they still have a very good chance of making the playoffs, but they have had to play. Uh, Parkview and Brookwood to open the region schedule so they actually dropped to 0-5 but you basically right now you have Brookwood, Archer and Parkview all undefeated in the region and then you have three teams that are all uh, winless with Grayson, Newton and South Gwinnett. The same thing happened last season in football when you had three teams in that three-way tie and then um for that number four seed, you had three teams tied for it. So as long as Grayson can rebound 
from falling to the top two teams, arguably um, Brookwood and Parkview, both of which are in the top ten. If they can beat Archer, I think they will be able to um, win it out in the end. But that is a tough loss, but also just another big win for, for Brookwood. Uh, you also had Marietta. They slid from number five to number eight after losing to Harrison. Uh, but then Harrison did not move up because after the big win over uh, Marietta, they lost two of three in their series against Hillgrove, who's unranked. Uh, Class 6A saw Etowa slide uh, to number four after its 13-3 to loss to Kell. By the way, Kell had won 10 straight, but they lost to Blessed Trinity last night. I tried to tell you, Blessed Trinity is the hottest team right now in 6A. And then Tip County, because of Etowah moving down to four, moved up to number three. They only have one loss. Then Habersham Central debuted at eight and replaced River Ridge in the top ten. Let's go to 5A real quick. Uh, Greater Atlanta Christian moved up to number five. Kell moved up to number six um, before last night's loss. GAC and Kell are going to be in a battle for uh, the region title uh, coming up next week. Uh, same scenario that happened in football last year. Uh, the Class 4A poll saw Cherokee Bluff, uh, the leader of Region 8, move up to number 2, and then North Hall moved up. That was before we saw the forfeits, but does not impact them in the region standings. Uh, the Class 3A poll saw Hebron and Franklin County moved up, and then Peach County fell to number 9 after losing, I think, 3 of 5. And then Class 3A, uh, this is an interesting one to look at, uh, Jeff Davis. They started this season 0-7. All of them were one or two uh, run losses uh, to higher classifications. So they were 0-7. Now they're 7-7, seven and seven, and they're undefeated in the region. All seven of the, those wins were in the region. Uh, so that is hats off to them, a tough 0-7 start. Now they're the front runners, and they are playing very well. Uh, Rock Martin Callaway replaced Cook and Landmark Christian in Class 2A. And then the Class A Division 1, you saw Bluckley County replace Temple at number 10. And then Miller County moved up a spot to number 9 in Class A Division 2 after picking up its 12th straight victory. And Wheeler County... Uh, we had Coach Smith talking about how good their baseball team is. They moved up to number eight. And a lot of those teams, whether it's uh, Sly County, Charlton, Wilcox, and Bacon Charter, it's the top four. They all have just one loss this season. And then you have big win streaks for Wheeler County, Miller County, Lake Oconee, and Bowden. So there weren't many teams that got booted out of the rankings this week, but there were uh, some common sense uh, moves that needed to happen. And you can see uh, those rankings posted at scoreatl.com. All right. One more quick thing to squeeze in um, before we close the show. I want to mention some of the top tennis players this year. And I'll do the, the girls next week. But these are the top ten. This came out in the tennis blog this week. You got Aiden Atwood of Lambert. He holds the state's number one ranking by the UTSA. He's already signed with UGA. He's ranked number five nationally and number nine in the nation by the UTSA rankings. Atwood won the 7A championship last spring and helped lead the Longhorns to the state title. He did not lose a high school match and was named for Scythe Player of the Year. Uh, Leighton Beasley from North Oconee. They are a true powerhouse, um, but it's going to be a very tough in Class 4. you got North Oconee and Westminster. They'll probably be in a head-to-head -head this year, um, but you're going to get to see two of the top players go up against each other. That's Leighton Beasley, the number one uh, singles for the Titans. He helped them reach the state finals last year. He's a senior now, ranked number 72 in the section. He is a Presbyterian College commit. Charlie Burdell from Westminster. He's back to full strength and ready to lead the Wildcats to their fourth straight state championship. He was the AJC Player of the Year in 2022. Uh, the five stars ranked number 18 and 121 in the nation. He is a Tulane commit. His teammate and brother, Jack Burdell, 
another senior, his twin. He is number 31 and 258 in the country. He's played number one at times. He's a Wofford commit. You got Andrew Hertfelder from Johns Creek. He is the number two for the Gladiators. They'll be in class 6A. You got Sonye Iyer from Chattahoochee. Um, Chattahoochee was state runner up last year in class 5A. You got Harrison Kemp, another 5A uh, stud from GAC. He is a four star. He's only a sophomore. And he played last year um, behind AJC Player of the Year, Jason Kim, who's now at Navy. Jacob Lee from Johns Creek, sorry, Johns Creek, five star sophomore, ranked number 305 in the country. He helped Johns Creek win a fifth straight state championship last year. You got Liam O'Leary from Mount Vernon. Uh, he also plays midfielder for the school soccer team. So that is a really impressive uh, anecdote right there. He's ranked number 54 in the UTSA. And then finally, Nick Wild from West Forsyth, a four-star sophomore. Wild helped the uh, Wolverines reach the championship game last spring at number one sing singles. So you got a lot of seniors, but also uh, a lot of sophomores on that list. Very uh, sophomore and senior heavy, but you can go to the AJC and check that out. But that's it. Um, we'll be back on Monday. Go to scoreatl.com. We got a bunch of uh, breaking news and articles up there, including a story on bass fishing, which is always fun. Now uh, that is uh, one of the highlights of spring when that closes out. And I think this is year three or four of it, but it's been growing significantly. But check it out. Hope everyone has a great weekend. And we'll see you Monday. What you doing? Hey, just finishing this claim to get Dave back on the road. Nice. I wonder what Dave's doing. We've got you covered.